All right, the next concept we're going to learn about is called the liquidity trap. And this is actually relatively complicated. I'm going to give an overview of it. I also want to state here that um, most of these topics are, um, are very rare, unit five. That's one reason it's so hard. So it's unlikely a lot of these will be on the exam this year. Remember, you only get two questions. Uh, but um, obviously, if kids can use their books and notes, which is what we are pretty sure the college board leader said, then we think they might have a pretty high standard for who passes. So if they want to make it so that like every year, only 55, 56% of the kids that take the exam pass, if they want to norm it or average it, if everybody does pretty well, they might throw some, you know, they might want to throw some tricky parts to the questions on. Anyway, one other thing I wanted to do is I said in the last video uh, that uh, Nazi Germany printed money. I wanted to uh, uh, catch my mistake before any hot dog AP European kids uh, like Taylor Bornstein or Chase Pittman or somebody jump on me and say, you know, of course, the Nazis didn't do that. It was the people before them. Anyway, I didn't realize I made that mistake, but this is econ. So who cares? So this next concept is the concept of the liquidity trap. OK. And so we're going to draw some graphs and I'm going to do some explaining here. Uh, this will almost assuredly be one of the questions you get asked Thursday. And again, I'm going to give you kind of a more complicated explanation, but what you can give me on Thursday is a lot simpler than this. Okay, so draw this in your notes. This is the ADSRAS graph. You can just pause it, the video here and draw it. Okay, but anyway, you can tell this is a recession. If you copied this down exactly right. Um, you can see here where, you know, it says recession. And obviously the intersecting uh, intersection of ADSRAS is on the left. So there's not enough gas in the tank. So now clearly what the US government would do <clears throat> is fiscal policy, which they would do one of three things. They would increase government spending, they would decrease taxes, or they would uh, increase transfer payments, okay? But let's say that you have uh, a president, you know, who's just been impeached by uh, Congress and uh, the president and Congress, you know, the head of at least some of the branches, they don't like each other, so they can't get anything done. Well, then it's left up to the Federal Reserve on its own to try to get the U.S. out of this crisis. So this is a recession. Luckily for us right now, Congress and the Federal Reserve are acting at the same time to try to correct this problem we're in right now. Okay, so now um, we're going to go on to the next slide. Now you've got this graph drawn on your paper just like that. Okay, so now I want you to draw the money market graphic, graphic here. So um, what you can do is pause the video and copy this down and make sure you're going to put 3% instead of rated equilibrium. Sometimes they actually give you the interest rate. Okay, so hopefully you've paused this and you've moved on. Uh, you can see their quantity of money. And so uh, anyway, so what's going on here is we're in a recession. Now, I should have told you to put these two graphs side by side, and I didn't do that, but we're in a recession. Uh, fiscal policy is moribund. The uh, Congress and the president cannot agree on what to do. So what would the Federal Reserve do? Well, remember what the Federal Reserve does is monetary policy, and they have three, possibly four tools. They can, in this case, um, they can decrease the reserve ratio, which would shift the money supply to the right. Uh, they can uh, decrease the, uh, shoot, oh my gosh, what's the interest rate? They can decrease the um, discount rate. <laughs> I'm having a senior citizen moment here. Decrease the discount rate, which would cause the money supply to shift to the right. Or they can practice open market operations. That's generally what they do. And I, I just, you're going to hear me saying this a lot because I, everyone expects to see this question on your essay this year if we're in a recession what can the government what, what can the federal reserve do they can buy or sell t-bills the correct thing to do in this case is buy t-bills if they buy t-bills that line is going to shift to the right the money supply line the fourth tool they have of course is they can target a lower federal funds rate uh, which is basically they're going to try and you know have banks loaned each other to lower interest rates, increase the money supply. Okay, but we're gonna say just for simplicity's sake here, what they do is they buy T-bills. Now, before we go to the next slide, 
3% is not a very high interest rate. So let's just say that, um, that my wife was pestering me to get a hair transplant. Okay. She's like, honey, I'm tired of your bald head. Yeah, this, the like, you know, you blind the preacher during the Sunday morning service. We can't go anywhere to a concert or anything when the lights pan the crowd. You know, you, the reflection off your head uh, blinds everybody. You need to get a hair transplant. Well, if I went down and tried to borrow, let's say they, let's say they cost twenty thousand dollars. If I went down to borrow, borrow the money, get this hair transplant, it would be three percent. That's a pretty low interest rate. But let's say we were in a recession like we are right now. If we were in a recession, I wouldn't want to do that. So here's what the Federal Reserve would do. To help out, they would buy T-bills, trying to increase the money supply, so the interest rate would go down. Okay, I'm going to go on to the next slide here. So here's what's happened. Uh, the U.S., uh, the, the Federal Reserve, the Fed, has bought T-bills, and I want you to pause the video and copy this down. Okay, hopefully you copied this down already so that you can put this on the same graph. But what's happened is the Federal Reserve, the Fed has bought T-bills and the money supply has increased. And so uh, you noticed it shifted to the right and now there's a new intersecting point. And what has happened is the interest rate, the nominal interest rate in this country has dropped from 3% to 1%. The whole reason the Federal Reserve did this was so that interest rates would get lower and people would spend money. But let's say, for whatever reasons, I'm, I'm too nervous about the economy. Let's say that even at 1%, I don't wanna borrow the $20,000 to have a hair transplant, or you don't wanna spend the money to get a new car. By the way, lots of car dealerships are running ads right now on TV, in the middle of this coronavirus, uh, you know, things saying, hey, you know, if you buy right now, we'll give you three months without payments. They're doing everything they can to try to reduce interest rates, uh, and to give you so many months without payments. I think I heard 90 days the other day trying to get people to buy their cars. Obviously, if you buy a car, that causes aggregate demand to go up. If enough people start spending money, the recession will end. But in this case, remember, we're talking about this concept of the liquidity trap. What has happened is interest is low. The Federal Reserve has forced interest down to 1%, and people like me are still not going to spend the money for whatever reason. And so here is the short definition of what a liquidity trap is. The short definition is it's when interest rates are already so low, the Federal Reserve is powerless or largely powerless in, able, in being able to increase aggregate demand by driving down the interest rates. Interest rates are so low, they really cannot go any lower. They could push it down to zero. Now. Uh, all right, so that's kind of the uh, shorter definition. I'll give it to you again. And this is what you can give me Thursday. A liquidity trap is when interest rates are so low, the Federal Reserve basically cannot rescue the economy by lowering them any further. People are just not borrowing money. And uh, even with the interest rates as low as 3%, so 1% maybe is not gonna make that much difference. That is the shorter version of what a liquidity trap is. Remember, Thursday, you're not going to have to draw any graphs. You're just going to have to explain it to me. Now, let me go on here. Uh, some people draw the liquidity trap like this. Now, you notice that red line there. And what they say is, now, they say it a little bit differently than I do. This is how I understand liquidity trap. The theory is, is that it has gone down so low, uh, people would just rather hold on to their money. And that's what that is. The demand for money, the demand to hold cash either in your... M1 in your checking account or in your possession is going to remain fixed. Okay, that's why the line becomes straight there. People are going to hold on to their money. That is a liquidity trap. For those of you overachievers who really want to understand it better, here is, if you can see up here, uh, I know you can see the address. I guess you can't see the address. Um, well, let me go here, see if I can move this up. There's the address. But if you just come back down here at the bottom, if you go to YouTube and you put in liquidity traps, macroeconomics, here's what I Googled. I put ACDC liquidity trap at YouTube. And uh, you can see Clifford's video on this. It's quite detailed. And if you're interested in this kind of thing, I recommend it. But what I gave you is good enough to get you by for right now. Okay, next topic, deficit surpluses and the public debt. Okay. All right, so write that title down. 
And the deficit is when the government spends more money than it takes in. Now, this is per year. And I'd be expecting this on Thursday. I may say, what's the deficit? That's when the government spends more money than it takes in. And here's an example. I want you to copy it down. Government uh, income is $100. What did they spend? $140. And so uh, remember, government income is taxes. And so there's a 40% negative for the year. That is called a deficit. Now, nowadays, they don't put them in red anymore, but I did it the old-fashioned way just because I want my students to be educated. Back in the day, if a company was losing money, they would say it is in the red, okay? Uh, and if it was making money, it was in the black. A lot of your econ books now show a company that's making money or a government having a surplus in green, and I think you can understand why they use green. Moving on to the next one. Surplus is when it takes in more than it spends. So copy this down. The government takes in 100 bucks and it spends 80. I should have put the bottom number as a negative number. So it takes $100 in, subtract out uh, 80, and they've got 20 bucks left over. The spending number should be negative, and the taxes should have been positive, but this is a surplus. Now, what? remember this is for one year. What is the deficit? I'm sorry, what is the debt? It's all of these added together. And so you can just rough this down in your notes, copy it down really quickly. It doesn't have to be pretty. Let's say the country started in 2008 and ran an $80 deficit that first year. So there's uh, four years with deficits and one with a surplus. All those netted together is $180, and that is the public debt. Remember that is overall. Moving on to the next topic. Next topic is the concept of the cyclically adjusted budget balance. If you remember what the budget balance is, well, we just did it. If you remember the business cycle, I'm, I'm used, doing this thing with my hands. I compare it to mountains and valleys. It's the normal ups and downs of the business cycle, okay? And um, so here's what happens. Let's say you're running a budget deficit of $100. Some people would say, well, you know, in a good year, we run a deficit of $100. What if it's a recession and we run a deficit of $180? Well, that extra $80 is because it's a recession. Uh, in, in a normal year, it would have only been $100. So what they have decided to do uh, this concept of the cyclically adjusted budget balance is they have decided to say, hey, what would the budget balance have been without the extraordinary circumstances? If you listen to Trump in a lot of his press conferences right now, he'll say two months ago, we had the lowest unemployment rate in the history of the country. True. Now we have one of the highest unemployment. You know, he keeps going back to that. So when he runs for re-election here in November, he may actually say, well, you know, hey, we had the best unemployment. What would unemployment have been if we had not had a uh, recession, the coronavirus? And so uh, it's kind of like a game with or without your best player in it. And you say, well, we lost to our arch rival, but we wouldn't have lost to him if we'd had our best player. Or if the ref had been better, how would it have gone? And here's a couple of graphics. That's a graphic for the business cycle. And here is the cyclically adjusted budget balance, a graphic here for that. As a coach, I'm over, I'm tired of, um, you know, thinking, hey, how would we have done in this game if, you know, so-and-so hadn't happened? And so this reminds me of when I was a kid. I don't know how much of that last uh, video played. My YouTube videos I've been trying to play, uh, haven't, the sound hasn't been coming out in the PowerPoint, but that was just an old ABC sports show and it would talk about the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. So whenever I think of the cyclically just at budget balance, I think of those games, you athletes understand what I'm talking about. The games that you could have won except for one mistake or one of your best players was out. And that is my comparison to the cyclically adjusted uh, budget balance. And this is the end of video two.